Hello, everybody. My name is Tafik Assad. I am a pulmonary and critical care physician and the director of the critical care unit and lung nodule program at Williamson Medical Center in Franklin, Tennessee. So I did my internal medicine residency and chief residency at Boston University Medical Center and then came down south to Nashville for my pulmonary and critical care fellowship at Vanderbilt University. I then completed my um, master's of science in clinical investigation there. And I've been working in clinical practice 20 miles south of Nashville in Franklin, Tennessee for the past four years. So thanks for coming. And I'm gonna to speak to you guys today about the clinical utility of the BioFire pneumonia PCR panel, really in general, but really highlighting the utility of this panel during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so here is my disclosure slide. So the broad overview of my talk is that I'm going to discuss COVID-19, something that really doesn't need much discussion or introduction in general terms, and then go into some of the published literature on bacterial co-infection or secondary infection in patients with COVID-19. I'll then sort of pivot to general challenges diagnosing pneumonia, followed by some of the advantages of the BIFIRE film array pneumonia panel. I'm then gonna go over several cases that I've encountered of bacterial pneumonia in patients with COVID-19 in my clinical practice and how the BioFire pneumonia panel has really fit in and transformed the way that we do things. So COVID-19, as I said, is an illness that to this audience really needs no introduction, but briefly, it is a systemic illness caused by the novel severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, shortened to SARS-CoV-2. It was first identified in Wuhan, China in December of 2019 and then declared a global pandemic several months later by the World Health Organization. The primary mode of transmission, like most respiratory uh, viral illnesses, is that of respiratory droplets, although we're now understanding that short-range aerosols certainly can play a role and maybe less so fomites. Median incubation period is about five days, although that can range from two to 14 days. And as of the uh, beginning of February, here are some of the most recent national and global statistics on the burden of this illness. 105 million cases globally and almost 27 million cases in the United States with 2.3 million deaths globally and approaching half a million deaths in the United States. And I will say that I've given this talk in some form or fashion over the past few months and it's been very sobering and disheartening to constantly update the statistic and see the rising uh, case burden and death toll from this viral illness. And so in general, the symptoms of COVID-19 are that of upper respiratory tract infection for most patients. So fevers, chills, headache, anosmia, nasal congestion. Now a sizable percentage of people have some upper or lower GI symptoms. And obviously if you have lower respiratory tract infection, cough, dyspnea, and respiratory failure are the symptoms that tend to predominate. It is diagnosed most definitively by nasopharyngeal PCR swab, uh, although we know that antigen testing is becoming a little bit more useful and commonplace and certainly in the screening modality. And the lab general laboratory evaluation is fairly nonspecific. So inflammatory markers are elevated, lymphopenia is often seen, coagulation parameters are generally very abnormal. And in patients who have lower respiratory tract infection, the diagnosis is often sealed uh, with classic bilateral infiltrates that we commonly see in patients with viral pneumonia. Phenothromboembolism and pulmonary embolism are also extremely common. And what makes this illness, in my opinion, so difficult to treat and explain to patients is that the severity of illness can vary wildly, anywhere from 80% of patients, the vast majority, to having mild or no symptoms, to a smaller percentage having more severe symptoms, and an even smaller percentage yet being critically ill, and many of these patients ultimately dying from the illness. Now I'm gonna transition into uh, COVID-19 and bacterial pneumonia. And so it is well established that viral upper and lower respiratory tract infections predispose patients to develop bacterial infections, particularly pneumonia. And so we know that the mechanism is likely multifactorial, but includes a combination of host relative immunosuppression due to the viral illness, enabling opportunistic bacteria to colonize the patient's upper and lower respiratory tracts, leading to damage of the mucosal layer leading to bacterial colonization, overgrowth, biofilm formation, and ultimately invasion. Now, this has been reported most commonly with influenza, particularly during, due, uh, during some of the most um, frequently reported influenza pandemics of the past century. 
And obviously during many of these previous pandemics, the mortality from this illness was largely driven by bacterial secondary infections. But it's also been reported during other coronavirus endemics, so MERS and SARS-CoV-1, particularly for patients who are critically ill in the ICU. Although, as I said, this can be reported and seen in essentially any upper or lower respiratory tract viral illness. Now, in the setting of COVID-19, I personally expected there to be high rates of reported bacterial secondary infection for a number of reasons. As I said, given the known association with previous respiratory viruses of this severity, but also given the fact that some of the treatments that we were giving earlier on and still for this pandemic, including steroids and immunomodulators such as tocilizumab, were drugs that certainly could uh, lead to increased bacterial secondary infections. However, the largest publication on this subject in the COVID era, published in July of 2020, this was a large meta-analysis looking at studies published between December of 2019 and March of 2020, didn't quite bear this out. And so here are all of the 24 studies, heavily weighted as you can see, due to the timing of this publication to Chinese case series, because this was, uh, at this time in the pandemic, most of the cases were in China or in Asia. You can see that there were very variable standards of antibiotic use, although in general, antibiotic use was extremely high. There was variation in terms of level of care. Many of these patients were floor patients, but there were some ICU patients scattered throughout. Treatments were non-standardized and the methodology for screening for infections was really all over the place. And so I think this slide released by the study authors uh, kind of summarizes the key findings pretty well. And so if you look at the 24 studies included in the meta-analysis, over 3000 patients with COVID from December of 2019 to March, 2020, they found a fairly low percentage of co-infection at the time of presentation, less than 5%. And these are patients who were diagnosed with their bacterial co-infection at the time of their presentation with COVID-19. If you look at those who were eventually diagnosed with a secondary infection after they presented with COVID-19, that number rose a little bit, but it's still less than 15%. Now, I think the really big and overwhelming caveats of this, of this large uh, publication is that there was no systematic screening for bacterial infections and empiric antibiotics were used extremely commonly, almost in three quarters of the cases. And if you look at some of the individual case series, it was apparently a rule that all of the patients who presented with COVID-19, regardless of symptoms, were given empiric antibiotics. So in my opinion, if you can imagine, in places where most patients were already on antibiotics and providers were almost certainly not aggressively screening for bacterial infections, but rather treating presumptively, and even if they did want to screen for infections with sputum or blood cultures, those cultures would be stifled by the fact that patients were already on empiric antibiotics. I think that this doesn't really do an accurate job reflecting the, the burden of bacterial infection in patients with COVID-19. So if you look at a couple of these studies a little bit more closely, I think you'll find that the authors did notice that although relatively uncommon in all patients with COVID-19, bacterial infections were much more common in critically ill patients. So looking at a few of these studies individually, ones that were included in that meta-analysis, this large case series out of China, in which about two thirds of patients were on empiric antibiotics, found that although bacteria infection was relatively uncommon in the total sample size, it was, over, it was seen in over one third of the critically ill patients in their intensive care unit. They reported a very high rate of ventilator associated pneumonia as well. Looking at another large case series out of China, where almost 100% of the patients received empiric antibiotics, they again found about 15% of these patients had bacterial infection secondary to COVID-19, although the median onset was almost over two weeks after the symptom onset with COVID-19. They found a very high rate of ventilator-associated pneumonia and about a third of their patients on mechanical ventilation. I think most strikingly, the overall survival of patients who developed a bacterial secondary infection was very poor with a nearly 100% mortality rate. Now, if you look at a few studies out of the United States and Europe that weren't included in this meta-analysis because they were published after that study, they found similar findings in terms of critically ill patients. The largest case series that was published out of New York City, which at the time was the height of the pandemic in the United States and the world as well, again, a very high percentage of empiric antibiotics, almost three quarter, and only 2% of patients have positive sputum culture. But if you look at the overall mortality, similar to that prior study, all, over one half of patients with a positive bacterial infection on sputum culture died, and then a third of those patients were, not, were still hospitalized at the time of study, and so their outcome was unknown. At this fairly large study published out of uh, ICUs in France, in which almost 100% of the patients were on mechanical ventilation, a slightly lower percentage of patients received empiric antibiotics, less than half, 
but at the time of ICU admission, somewhere between a quarter and a third of patients were co-infected with bacteria uh, at the time of their admission to the ICU. So finally, if you look at this, the largest autopsy study, which was published out of COVID-19, looking at patients in New York City and Italy, they noticed that somewhere between a quarter and a third of patients had evidence of bacterial or fungal pneumonia at the time of their autopsy. And this from a study where only 40% of patients were ever intubated. So one has to imagine that in ventilated patients, this number would have almost certainly have been higher. So I think in summary, although maybe the total incidence of bacterial infections in patients with COVID-19 is not extremely high, in patients that are critically ill and particularly on mechanical ventilation, I think the rate of bacterial secondary infection is actually quite high and a very poor prognostic sign. So let's change gears a little bit and discuss the way that we currently diagnose bacterial pneumonia. And so the, the diagnostic paradigm for uh, lower respiratory tract infections from bacterial pneumonia is really that of, uh, of characteristic symptoms, imaging findings, and lab evaluation. So everybody knows that the characteristic pulmonary symptoms are cough or sputum production, shortness of breath, chest pain, and the systemic symptoms I'm talking about are that of infection, fevers, chills, sweats. The problem is that these symptoms are relatively nonspecific and in and of themselves do not provide much help in distinguishing different types of infectious syndromes. Chest imaging is necessary. However, the pattern on chest x-ray is also nonspecific. And we know that many types of pneumonia have very similar radiographic findings and many non-infectious causes of infiltrates such as aspiration or heart failure or cancer can look similar. Lastly, routine laboratory like inflammatory markers, white blood cell counts, uh, and I'll go into procalcitonin in a moment, can be useful in certain situations that are relatively nonspecific. And in my opinion, the real challenge in the COVID era is that there is a ton of overlap with all of these criteria with COVID-19. So it's really challenging to diagnose somebody with a bacterial secondary infection due to the fact that all of the symptoms, imaging findings, and lab evaluation in general can overlap with the COVID-19 syndrome. And so for that reason, we really need to rely on specific and targeted microbiologic testing in order to seal that diagnosis. So what do I mean by micro microbiologic testing for pneumonia? Well, many of us use procalcitonin as a uh, lab test in order to distinguish viral from bacterial infections. And we certainly have relied fairly heavily on procalcitonin in situations uh, to see if somebody did have a bacterial secondary infection. But the problem is procalcitonin, like many inflammatory markers, oftentimes is elevated or falsely elevated in severe cases of COVID-19 without a bacterial infection. And so it is not always as useful in these syndromes as it is de facto. What I would consider the gold standard, and most people would call the gold standard for diagnosing a lower respiratory tract infection is the sputum gram stain in culture, or also the blood culture in general. I'll go into this uh, in a little bit more detail in a moment, but there are significant limitations to sputum gram stain in culture. There are a number of antigen and serology tests, either on the urine or blood, looking for specific pathogens, such as strep pneumonia, legionella, mycoplasma. These can be useful, however, depending on the institution, turnaround time on this testing can take days, and you'd have to order each one of these tests individually in order to diagnose the patient with their particular bacterial infection. So lastly, there are nasopharyngeal swabs, either antigen or PCR tests, looking at single viruses, such as influenza or RSV, and obviously we're all very comfortable with ordering nasopharyngeal swabs for SARS-CoV-2, for single bacteria like the, the MRSA nasal swab, or multiplex panels of different viruses or different viruses and bacteria that one can be that one can order. The problem is that there's many overlap in all of these clinical syndromes, and so you'd have to order an individual influenza and an individual RSV, and then the, or maybe the multiplex panel. And really, there's just many tests that one would have to order, and it, the turnaround time, depending on the test, can be longer. So let me let me go into the microbiologic yield of the quote unquote gold standard, which is that of sputum culture. And if you look over many clinical trials, you'll find that the gold standard uh, sputum culture is extremely poor. The diagnostic yield is somewhere around 10%, and this is over a number of clinical trials that have looked at this. And really, it's probably multifactorial, but uh, the biggest problem I would say is empiric antibiotic definitely in, hinders the ability of sputum culture to detect a pathogen. You know, poor sampling, so if people can't give you a good lower respiratory tract specimen, there is significant oropharyngeal contamination, which then alters the ability of the sputum culture to detect the lower respiratory tract pathogen. Now, there are some situations in which the sputum culture yield is going to be higher, 
So people who are very ill from strep pneumonia or people who are immunosuppressed certainly do have higher yields in sputum culture. And we do rely in these situations on adjunctive testing like procalcitonin or antigen testing or PCR testing to improve the yield. But again, we're talking about a fairly poor test and then adding on multiple other tests on top of it, each one of them that you have to order individually, each one of them with their own turnaround time. And maybe one of the biggest challenges with sputum culture is many patients just can't provide one. And so they maybe aren't making sputum or don't have the coordination to cough it up into a cup. So the yield of sputum culture is so bad that the American Thoracic Society and Infectious Disease Society of America and their 2019 guidelines on community acquired pneumonia are actually only recommending sputum culture for cases of severe community acquired pneumonia, ones in which a suspected multi-drug resistant pathogen or in hospital acquired and ventilator associated pneumonias. So the, the ATS and IDSA acknowledge that there are significant limitations in sputum culture. And what they also state in their guidelines is that rapid, cost-effective, sensitive, and specific diagnostic test is, tests are recommended in order to target therapy appropriately. And I think that's a really great segue into the biofire pneumonia panel. So for those who aren't familiar, this is an automated system in which nucleic acids are extracted and purified from a specimen. Multiplex PCR is performed and viral and bacterial DNA targets are identified. The sample handling time is extremely quick, less than two minutes, and results are generated within 45 minutes to one hour, depending on the panel. So this is a multimodal panel in which you can test blood culture. So obviously blood specimens, you can do, there's a meningitis and encephalitis panel, which can be drawn on cerebral spinal fluid. There is a gastrointestinal panel, which can be uh, done on stool specimens, obviously. An upper respiratory panel with a nasopharyngeal swab. And then what I'm gonna spend the most time on, and this is the most, the, the newest uh, addition to the uh, film array system is the pneumonia panel. This can be run on expectorated sputum, or if a patient is on mechanical ventilation, an endotracheal aspirate, or on a bronchial alveolar lavage. Now, the specificity and sensitivity for all of the pathogens, which I'll go into in a moment, is extraordinarily high, approaching that of 100%. So here's an infographic which kind of goes through the process and the simplicity of the system. So you can see after the pouch is placed into the loading station, the sample and hydration solution are injected. You then take the pouch and then load it into the film array device and you get your results within 45 minutes to one hour. And honing in on the pouch, the pouch is really what makes the film array system so unique. In a lot of ways, it's like a miniature laboratory all rolled into one. And so starting on the left, going to the right, you can see that the sample is injected, cell lysis occurs, DNA and RNA are purified and multiplex PCR is performed in order to isolate viral and bacterial DNA targets. So here are the things that are on the Biofire Film Array Pneumonia panel. So I'm gonna go through all of these starting on the left. You can see that there are eight viruses on, on the panel. And specifically, I'm gonna point out that the coronavirus that is listed is the seasonal coronavirus. So this is not SARS-CoV-2. Now, it is also worth pointing out that the Biofire Film Array Upper Respiratory Panel does have SARS-CoV-2 on its panel, and that there is the hope in the near future that the SARS-CoV-2 will be added to the pneumonia panel as well. So you can see these are qualitative viruses, which means it is either detected or not detected. There are three qualitative bacteria, the ones that are most commonly associated with atypical bacterial infections, so Legionella, Chlamydia, or Mycoplasma. Moving to the middle of the screen, you can see that there are 15 semi-quantitative bacteria listed in alphabetical order. So there is a, a decent spattering of gram-positive, mostly strep and staph species, and a number of gram-negative pathogens known to cause bacterial pneumonia. And when I say semi-quantitative, what I mean by that is there is a minimum threshold. So there has to be 10 to the 3.5 copies per ml of each one of these bacterial targets identified in the specimen. If it is detected, but less than that threshold, it is reported as not detected. But if it is detected greater than that threshold, they then give you what is called a semi-quantitative bin, which, which tells you if the bacteria is seen at 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth, or greater than or equal to 10 to the seventh copies per ml, a sort of relative uh, estimate of bacterial burden in the specimen. And then lastly, on the right, there are seven antimicrobial resistance genes, specifically the MEK A slash C and MREJ genes, 
which are known to confer methicillin resistance to Staphylococcus aureus. There are five different carbapenemase genes, specifically KPC and the other ones listed. And then there is the CTXM gene, which is known to cause uh, extended spectrum beta-lactam resistance. And so in total, if you count up the resistance genes, the semi-quantitative bacteria, the viruses, and the qualitative bacteria, there are 33 targets on this entire panel, all resulted within one hour. And so here is a sample report that you can expect, although these can be tailored at your different institutions. So at ours, it looks a little bit different, but you can see on this John Doe specimen, Jane Doe specimen, sorry, there were uh, three bacterial targets identified, Enterobacter, Morexella, and Streptopneumonia. You can see that of all of them, the Morexella was detected at the highest bin mount, greater than or equal to 10 to the seventh, followed by Streptopneumo, followed by the Enterobacter. And then later on in the report, you can see that they tested for antimicrobial resistance genes and did not detect any. None of the atypical bacteria were seen as well. And lastly, there, were, there was viral and bacterial co-infection with the presence of rhinovirus and RSV in the specimen as well. One thing I wanna point out, if you look at the antimicrobial resistance genes, you'll see that the MECA slash C and MREJ genes were reported as not applicable. That is because that the, they only report the presence or absence of the respective resistance genes in the presence of an appropriate infection. So since MEC A slash C and MRAJ genes are only seen in Staph aureus species, since no Staph aureus was detected, they didn't report whether it was seen or not. And the same goes for the carbapenemase and ESBL resistance genes. Those will only be reported in the presence of a corresponding gram-negative infection. And so this is how BioFire validated their pneumonia panel. They performed a clinical trial at six academic medical centers and two pediatric hospitals, looking at approximately 840 BAL and sputum specimens from 2016 to 2017 at these facilities. And what they did is after excluding patients with cystic fibrosis and patients with tuberculosis, they looked at specimens that were left over, ordered by providers for whatever reason they were ordered. So if somebody at one of these institutions ordered a sputum culture, and there was fresh specimen, never frozen. What they did is they took that specimen and they ran, ran a test. They compared the BioFire film array pneumonia panel to a reference laboratory comprehensive culture. Just to define what comprehensive culture means, for each specimen, they plated it on four different types of media at four different dilutions. So that means for every specimen that they, they did the comprehensive culture on, there were 16 plates. I think we can all agree that that is much more comprehensive than, even, than the routine culture done by even the most stellar microbiologists at our own institutions. And so looking at this, this data, this is what they found. So uh, starting at the left, uh, looking at expectorated sputum, and then we'll finish by looking at BAL specimens. In 39% of cases, they found that both technologies, sputum culture and the pneumonia PCR panel, did not identify a pathogen. And then in just over 34% of cases, a bacteria was confirmed by both methods. So in the 39% and the 34%, both tests were congruent. However, in 27% of cases, just over a quarter, they found a bacterial target identified by the pneumonia PCR panel and not by comprehensive culture, whereas in less than 1% of cases, the opposite was true. Looking to the right at BAL specimens, in 62% of cases, both modalities did not detect a bacterial pathogen. In 16% of cases, both modalities did. However, again, in almost a quarter of cases, the pneumonia PCR panel did detect a bacterial target, whereas comprehensive culture did not. And again, in less, of one, less than 1% of cases, the opposite was true. Now, this is just a comparison of bacterial identification. And when you factor in the detection of viruses, something that routine, obviously, comprehensive culture cannot do, in 32% of cases for the sputum, and in 16% of cases with the BAL, a viral target was identified. And if you ignore cases in which co-infection occurred, which happened in about 20% of the time in the expectorated sputum and 5% of the time in BAL specimens, and approximately 10% of cases in which either test did not identify a bacterial target, there was a viral pathogen isolated by the pneumonia PCR panel. And so now when you sum up this data and look at the overall yield in sputum culture, a bacterial target in comprehensive culture was found in 34% of cases, but the pneumonia PCR panel identified a bacterial or viral pathogen in 72% of cases, and that's a doubling of the yield. If you look at BAL, 
in the comprehensive culture found a bacterial pathogen in 16% of cases, but the pneumonia PCR panel identified a pathogen in 48%, thereby tripling the yield. So I think it's pretty clear that the pneumonia PCR panel greatly improves our ability to diagnose a particular pathogen when compared to even the most comprehensive of culture. And this doesn't even factor in the fact that the rapid turnaround time of this test is less than one hour compared to several days by culture alone. And also that the antimicrobial resistance genes are reported on the pneumonia PCR panel, something that may come back with the sputum culture, but again, days later. And so now I'm gonna transition and talk about how this panel has been used in my patient's population during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and beyond. So starting with a little bit of background, so my hospital is an approximately 200 bed community hospital, 20 miles south of Nashville, Tennessee. In total, looking through 2020's data at my institution from March of 2020 to the end of December of 2020, we admitted over 700 patients with COVID-19. There was a slight male predominance. The median age at our institution was 70 years old for all patients hospitalized. And I think that's a, a reflection of a couple things. In general, patients hospitalized with COVID-19 tend to be slightly older, and also our community is a relatively older community, and this is just the patient population that we serve. So if you look at the, the breakdown of where these patients were and what they had, about a quarter of the patients were in our intensive care unit, but it is worth pointing out that at our institution, uh, some patients who have quote-unquote stable high-flow nasal cannula needs are not admitted to the ICU, but monitored on the floor or in a more, more of a step-down sort of uh, modality. And so I know at a number of institutions, high flow nasal cannula patients are exclusively taken care of in the ICU. So if you call those patients ICU patients, about a third of our patients in total needed the ICU at some point during their illness. Most of them because of high flow nasal cannula, some of them on BiPAP, and in total 7% or 50 patients were on mechanical ventilation at our institution. And if you look at our outcomes, our overall mortality was about 15%, um, but obviously much higher in patients with worsening respiratory failure. We did have a mortality of about 70% for patients on mechanical ventilation. And again, largely driven by the fact that many of our patients were older and uh, a number of publications have shown that mortality in the COVID-19 pandemic is proportional to age. So we don't have an official policy on sputum sampling in our institution. It is up to the discretion of the ordering provider. And so what I ended up doing was looking at all of our sputum sampling during the COVID-19 pandemic, again, from March of 2020 to December of 2020. And 30 patients or so had just sputum culture ordered without a pneumonia PCR panel. Two patients had a pneumonia PCR panel without sputum culture. And in the vast majority of cases, 48 patients had both a sputum culture or endotracheal aspirate culture in addition to the pneumonia PCR panel. So in total, we did about 80 sputum cultures and 50 pneumonia PCR panels. And in total, I, I looked at and crunched all of our numbers. Of all, the, of all those 50 patients who had a pneumonia PCR panel, 35 of them had some bacterial target identified, so positive in 70% of cases, regardless of expectorated or endotracheal aspirate. I will also point out that due to concern about aerosolation, aerosolization, particularly early on in the pandemic, we have not been doing bronchoscopy with bronchial alveolar lavage with much regularity, uh, but certainly we are doing um, endotracheal aspirates with saline lavage or mini VALs uh, when needed. So here's a breakdown of the pathogens that we found. So as I said, 30% of the time, no pathogen. 30% of the time, a single pathogen was found. And in 40% of cases, multiple pathogens were identified. And here's the breakdown if you look by organism. So 28 documented gram-positive infections, the vast majority of which were Staph aureus with a fairly even breakdown between MRSA and MSSA, and then a few different strep species thereafter. And then 29 different gram-negative neg infections, the majority of which were Klebsiella, but you can see a, a nice breakdown of Enterobacter, E. coli, H. flu, Pseudomonas, and a few others. Overall, we only had one viral co-infection, which was rhinovirus during the entire pandemic, which mirrors a lot of the data published that other respiratory virus uh, uh, documentation and diagnosis were extremely low during this pandemic, likely due to social distancing and increased mask usage. We did find two cases of ESPL due to the CTXM gene. Both of these cases were later confirmed by culture to in fact be ESPL. We had no cases of carbapenemase gram-negative rods, not terribly surprising given our very low prevalence of these infections in general. 
And as I already stated, there were 11 cases of MRSA and 10, sorry, 10 cases of MRSA and 11 cases of MSSA. And all of these cases, all 21 later matched up with the sputum culture resistance testing down the road. I'm gonna go over two cases in depth and then a few cases kind of more rapid fire. This first case I call the look early case. This is a 73 year old female whose only real me medical problem is obesity who presented to the hospital with fever, cough and anorexia. She had symptoms develop about a week prior to admission and was confirmed in an outpatient nasopharyngeal PCR swab ordered by a primary care provider to have COVID-19. She was at home for the week, but developed worsening dyspnea and symptoms, and so came to the emergency room and was found to have an oxygen saturation 85% on room air, quickly improved on two liters, and admitted to the hospital ward and treated with dexamethasone and remdesivir. Her initial workup was fairly consistent with most of the patients we've seen with COVID-19, lymphopenia, transaminitis, elevated inflammatory coagulation mark. This is the chest X-ray that was ordered on the day of her admission, which I think we can all agree so shows diffuse reticular nodule or infiltrates consistent with COVID-19 or other viral uh, pattern infiltrates. And so unfortunately, like many cases, 36 hours into her hospitalization, her oxygen requirements worsened. We put her on high flow nasal cannula, which lasted about 48 hours, but she developed tachypnea, hypoxia, and worsening encephalopathy. On the day of her progression, she had low grade temperatures. She had a white blood cell count throughout her hospitalization that ranged from normal to just minimally elevated. And unfortunately, four days into her admission, she had to be intubated for worsening respiratory failure. Here is her chest X-ray, one that I know that most of the people listening to this talk have seen, this pro rapid progression from bilateral infiltrates to you know, diffuse worse, worsening infiltrates and worsening ARDS. And so the patient was on mechanical ventilation and uh, one of the, the policies, not unofficial policies at our institution is to perform an endotracheal aspirate at the time of intubation. And what I'm gonna do in this case is highlight sort of two alternate realities. One in which we didn't have the pneumonia PCR panel, which in our case we did, but to sort of show sort of you the timeline of what to expect with routine conventional endotracheal aspirates, culture, et cetera and one timeline if you do have the pneumonia PCR panel. So in this case, on day zero, when the patient was intubated, we performed an endotracheal aspirate and the, the gram stain showed an inflammatory specimen with white blood cells, gram positive cocci and gram negative rods. Depending on the institution or the provider, you would have either maybe withheld antibiotics if you were uh, doing the more antibiotic stewardship approach, potentially put her on empiric antibiotics and seen, but either way, you wouldn't have known for sure. Within a day, a culture would have been in progress and you would have potentially put her on broad spectrum antimicrobials. Uh, and in this case, that would have been way too broad, but let's say vancomycin and cefepim or vancomycin and zosin or something like that. And then a day later, you would have found three plus staph aureus on culture. So you could have probably dropped the cefepim and kept her on vancomycin. But in this case, that would have still been too broad because within another day, the sensitivity panel would have demonstrated that the patient had MSSA. And then at that point, three days into her worsening respiratory failure, you would have placed her on cefazolin and finally got her, gotten her on the right antibiotics. Now let's play out the scenario if we did have the pneumonia PCR panel, which we did, which would have shown within one hour of intubation, the patient had the presence of greater than or equal to 10 to the seventh copies per ml of Staph aureus. And the MEK A slash C and MREHA genes in her case were not detected. So based on that information, with the pneumonia PCR panel, within one hour of intubation, we would have started the patient on cefazolin, which would have been the right antibiotic at the right time, no delay, and no excessive antibiotic exposure. So that's what we did, but unfortunately, like in too many cases we've seen during this pandemic, despite, despite appropriate antibiotic use and full supportive measures, she expired two weeks after admission with refractory and worsening hypoxemic respiratory. I think we can all agree that in this case, the patient came in ill with COVID-19, but bacterial co-infection certainly contributed to her respiratory decline and ultimately to her death. And so I think this case uh, really highlights a couple things. First off, the BioFire film array panel leads to rapid detection, changing management instantly. And in the antimicrobial stewardship era, this is extraordinarily important. If we did not have the pneumonia PCR panel, the patient would have either had inadequate 
or inappropriately broad antibiotics for three days if we were relying on culture alone. We know that in general, excessive antibiotics can lead to adverse effects in as many as 20% of patients. And so that is Clostridium difficile infection or increased, increased prevalence of multidrug resistant pathogens or other toxicities. And so it is extremely common that patients get excessive antibiotics and have issues related to that. We also know that it's better for the healthcare system, battling antibiotic resistance, reducing length of stays, et cetera, to avoid excessive antibiotic use. My second case is not only look, oft, look early, but look often. And so this is a guy who, who is still in the hospital, but he's 61, he's got hypertension and obesity, who came to us with worsening dyspnea. His symptoms also began about a week prior to admission, and his labs and workup were also similar to most of the patients we've seen with COVID-19, leukopenia, hyponatremia, mild acute kidney injury, and elevated inflammatory and coagulation parameters. He, unlike the other patient, was not diagnosed in the outpatient setting, but came to our emergency room and had a nasopharyngeal PCR, which confirmed SARS-CoV-2 and was diagnosed with COVID-19 with pneumonia. This is his chest X-ray on admission, and I think we can all agree that he has bilateral infiltrates. He was tachycardic, febrile, tachypnic, hypoxic. He was initially kind of quickly up titrated up to high flow nasal cannula, started on dexamethasone and remdesivir and admitted into our intensive care unit because he, despite being on high flow nasal cannula, was, was working fairly hard to breathe. And within 24 hours, this is a chest X-ray performed um, right after he was intubated. He progressed and so the patient had to be intubated for worsening hypoxemic respiratory failure. I think we can all agree that he has worsening infiltrates as well. And as I said before, similar to our, previ our, our, our previous patient, uh, we did perform an endotracheal aspirate soon after um, intubation, and he had 10 to the fifth strep agalactiae. And so for this, we started ceftriaxone. The patient was supported over the next week, but unfortunately, about seven days later, the patient had a clinical change. He was mildly hypothermic. He had a rising white blood cell count. He had a change in his uh, sputum in which we were aspirating green more productive phlegm. And this is a chest X-ray, which I think we, we can all agree shows worsening infiltrates, still has some very dense peripheral infiltrates, but now has worsening infiltrates in the lower lobes, right more than left. And so we performed an additional endotracheal aspirate, which has been our practice. So if somebody has a clinical change and a worsening, we order a follow-up endotracheal aspirate to look for a, second, a new secondary infection. And in this case, uh, we, were, we were surprised that the patient had greater than or equal to 10 to the seventh E. coli, in addition to the CTXM gene, and the patient had 10 to the fourth Staph aureus with the MEK A slash C and MRAJ genes. So in this case, we diagnosed the patient with a second secondary infection, not just uh, the strep species, but now MRSA likely and an ESBL E. coli. So we stopped ceftriaxone. We started the patient on linazolid and meropenem. And within a couple of days, his sputum culture confirmed that he had three plus E. coli ESBL and one plus MRSA. Luckily over the next week or so, his uh, lab parameters, his ventilator requirements, his secretions all improved. He ended up undergoing tracheostomy and PEG-2 placement because at this point we were about three weeks into his hospitalization. He also had, had some fairly severe delirium. And so in order to slowly wean him from the ventilator, we performed that sort of interesting wrinkle in this guy's case is that after he completed his meropenem and linazolid, he developed a rash with peripheral eosinophilia up to 20% transaminitis, and we suspected that he developed dress syndrome. So again, speaking of toxicity of excessive antibiotics, and in this case, they were necessary, but uh, he had already completed his antibiotic course, and so we gave him high-dose steroids. Uh, luckily, that did help the dress syndrome. That actually helped his infiltrates a great deal, he then developed a GI bleed and was critically ill from that. But luckily the patient, although he does remain hospitalized, is expected to fully recover. His most recent chest X-ray performed several days ago shows a marked clearing of his bilateral infiltrates. He has now been decannulated from his uh, tracheostomy and we are just working on placement. And so again, I think this case highlights that the BioFire film array pneumonia panel can lead to rapid detection and can change your management instantly. But unlike the previous case, this case highlights the other end of the antibiotic spectrum, which is that of emerging antibiotic resistance. And so we know that antimicrobial 
Um, we know that drug resistant pathogens are on the rise in the United States and globally, and that empiric broad spectrum antimicrobials do not necessarily cover many of the resistant pathogens that we are seeing these days, and particularly in this case, the ESBL. It is also important to remember that this assay, the antimicrobial assay, the resistance genes are not the same as, as performing antimicrobial, uh, this not the same as um, antibiotic resistance testing that is done by your laboratory. But I think we'd all agree that since we saw evidence of an MRSA and an ESBL infection, broadening of antibiotics based on that information was appropriate. And in this case, uh, I think it ended up being life-saving for this patient. So a few quick cases of other patients that we used the pneumonia PCR panel who were not on mechanical ventilation. So these are people who did an expectorated sputum specimen. We had a fairly young guy with asthma on high flu nasal cannula and uh, leukocytosis, febrile, bilateral infiltrates, expectorated greater than 10 to the seventh staph aureus, also with the MEK A slash C and MRAJ genes. So not somebody who we were empirically gonna put on uh, vancomycin, confirmed later to have MRSA on sputum culture, treated with vancomycin, did well after seven days. A 75-year-old guy, chronic lung disease, also on high flow nasal cannula, also with leukocytosis, febrile, bilateral infiltrates, had a polymicrobial detection, in his case, E. coli, Klebsiella, and strep pneumo. While we were waiting on the official antimicrobial resistance testing, we empirically put him on cefepine based on this information. Eventually, he was found to have pan-sensitive species and was de-escalated to ceftriaxone, had a slower recovery, but eventually discharged to a skilled nursing facility. And lastly, a 50-year-old guy with chronic variable immunodeficiency uh, actually had no evidence of a leukocytosis, ended up finding Pseudomonas arginosa at 10 to the fifth copies per ml, confirmed on culture, also placed on cefepime initially because we did not know the resistance of the bacteria, but when it was found to be pansensitive, was transitioned to ciprofloxacin and discharged home after several and so wrapping up at this time, I'm gonna go over some potential limitations and considerations when using this panel. First off, false positives can certainly be seen. And so there are gonna be situations where polymicrobial detection is found. And based on our data, as you heard, it was actually more likely if you found a bacterial target to find multiple bacterial targets than a single one. So in our 70% of cases in which we did find a bacterial target, uh, you know, the 40% of those in total did have polymicrobial detection and 30% were a single pathogen. This is almost certainly gonna be more common in people with chronic lung disease, people with airway colonization, and in our findings, patients who are on mechanical ventilation and who have ventilator-associated pneumonia with polymicrobial um, detection. You can rely on lower respiratory tract specimens in this, in this situation if you do fear for colonization or upper, upper, upper respiratory bacterial contamination it has not been our routine practice to perform bronchoscopy in these situations, but certainly something to consider. And don't forget that the quantitative results uh, do help to distinguish colonization somewhat, because if it is detected at less than 10 to the 3.5 copies per ml, it is reported as not detected. And so that is at least one way in which the BioFire panel attempts to screen for airway colonization. But also the bin count, so if you find multiple pathogens, it has been our practice to rely more heavily or to trust the, the bacteria that was found at the highest bin count is the most pathogenic uh, bacteria. But clinical judgment is just gonna have to be used in those situations. And also there is certain circumstances where there might be false negatives. And so don't forget that there are 15 semi-quantitative bacteria, three qualitative bacteria and, and the eight viruses on the, on the uh, panel, but there are gonna be some pathogens that a patient may have that are not on this panel. And so if the patient has an exotic viral infection or an exotic bacterial infection, it'll present as not detected, although they may still have a legitimate infection. Um, don't forget that the quality of the specimen can greatly affect the yield. And so if you do a bronchialveolar lavage, you're gonna get a more dilute specimen and you're gonna be less likely to detect pathogens. If you get a very poor expectorated sputum specimen that is contaminated by oral saliva, you're not gonna get a good yield. And so garbage in, garbage out. This is true for any test, but something to keep in mind for the pneumonia PCR panel. I think one important point that I like to highlight at the end is that don't forget that there's no such thing as a perfect test. And so earlier on, I told you that the yield of sputum culture is around 10%. Yet none of us, I think, are gonna blink twice when ordering a sputum culture and interpreting it with all the limitations of sputum culture. And so we are, in general, far more forgiving for established and older and tests that we're more comfortable with than for newer tests. And we have a, a much more unreasonable and high bar for, for these new tests. This is not a perfect test, but I think, I hope this talk has kind of shown you, it is 
extremely useful in my clinical practice and an amazing adjunctive test in diagnosing lower respiratory tract infections. So in summary, bacterial co-infection or secondary infection are probably more common than previously reported and previously thought of in the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly in patients that are critically ill, particularly in patients who are on mechanical ventilation. And that given significant overlap with COVID-19 in terms of symptoms and x-rays and routine microbiologic testing, establishing the diagnosis can be extremely challenging. But through the use of the BIFAR filmarane pneumonia panel, it's really helped me, and I think it can help other providers rapidly diagnose or exclude specific pathogens, leading to early de-escalation of antibiotics in the appropriate situations, or the early escalation of antibiotics in the, in the setting of resistant pathogens.